So, uh, <laughs> uh. so perfect. So welcome back, everyone. So we're back for track two on the first edition of Remote Pi Data Dublin. And now we have Niall O'Connor. And Niall has a CS major. Uh, he works at a bank. Uh, he likes to bake. He grows vegetables in his back garden. And he also has a very good experience to talk about coronavirus because he got coronavirus last year, still in 2019. So he was not one of the first ones. And he is going to talk to us a little bit about training bots, signals, and AI. Excited about this. Thank oh, you. Uh, first of all, I thought Arjuman's talk was really, really good. Um, that is a very important uh, topic. Fake news is a really dangerous thing. Actual fake news, not people calling real things fake news. Um, if you can see my screen, I'm going to jump onto my slides now. Ooh, let me get up to the start. Um, <clears throat> maybe I'll expand these. I'm not sure if I need to, but sure. We'll go with it. Now, um, I had an idea for a talk on trading a while back, and I had often wondered what is the secret of trading. And um, rather than approach it from a data point of view, I created a trading account in the, using the Investopedia simulator game. Where you're given $100,000 or $10,000, whichever you choose. And then you have to uh, try and make money out of that. So I opened that account last September and I just broke $400,000 there today. So it's a pretty good return. Um, and I've been trying to teach a machine how to do it, but unfortunately uh, I've been hampered many times. So, so I'm gonna go through some of the problems I've seen with trying to do this thing. Um, and some of the sort of, I suppose not failures, but the reasons that other people who've attempted this don't have much success because um, they're probably not as familiar with the problem. Um, so what is the goal of trading? Uh, to make lots of money while not breaking the risk appetite would be uh, Bank of America's uh, statement on that. Uh, anybody out there who's trying to buy and sell stuff on the stock market, obviously they want to make money and obviously they want to make as much money as they can. Um, but there are rules in place that prohibit them from doing certain things. Good rules uh, for good reasons. And a lot of these things might not be understood by people who want to trade. Um, but the first thing is that traders will trade anything and everything they can get their hands on and often many things at once. And so one of the approaches I often see where people uh, try and crack trading is they will examine a trend for a company like Amazon and figure out when to buy it just with one stock. And, and that's, that's not going to get you very far, be, and we'll see that in a second. Um, so things that you can buy and sell if you're in the world of finance, uh, where they are short on a lot of computer programmers. Incidentally, if anyone knows Cobalt, you're going to be worth a lot of money in the next few months. Um, so things you can buy and sell, you can buy and sell stock. That's what Apple and Microsoft and all these guys have and Facebook. Um, an option to buy or sell a stock, which is like a little ticket that you get, say this is a ticket here, and it gives you an option to buy it at a certain price, and if the stock becomes way less uh, valued than that price, you're not gonna buy it for a high price, just throw away the ticket, it's not needed anymore. A future contract, very important to a farmer, um, I guarantee I'll pay you next year for that uh, corn or that beef or whatever it is, and you get the money up front to go off and make the commodity. Sometimes people just wanna buy straight up commodities like oil or, or gold or, or something like that. Uh, forward trades, I want to buy it in a year and we'll agree the price today and I'll buy it in a year for that price. Bonds, you give me a loan, I'll pay you back the loan plus a bit of interest. And when, when you give me that loan, I give you a bond, which is a meaningless piece of paper, but uh, it's a special type of loan and you can go off and say that I'm a AAA rated guy, guaranteed to pay you, legally obliged to pay you. And all of that money plus the interest I'm going to give you is now an asset to you. Uh, that's a dangerous thing where a loan becomes an asset. Um, but corporations, sovereigns, which are countries, and municipals, states, or cities like Barcelona City or Detroit City would use bonds. So they're the actual things you can buy and sell. But what guys more often than not want to do is sign on the dotted line for the agreement and then sell their signature, sell that slot, that position. So someone else can strike the deal and if it's looking really lucrative, they could say, hey, do you want to buy into my end of the deal before it comes to fruition and you're guaranteed to make a lot of money? 
and they can sell out early for a smaller amount of the profit. Um, and the last major thing, which is definitely ooh, the signal for us in the world that, we're, that we're, we're at the end of this huge stock bubble, is selling your assets, which is any of these things, overnight for cash. It's called a repurchase agreement or a repo. It's like pawning 24 hours, 72 hours, depends on what the agreement is. And that stuff is really, really dangerous. Um, so there are the things you can buy and sell. And buying and selling lots of them is what a good trading algorithm needs to do. And in order to buy and sell lots of things, you're going to need a lot of data. And this is a Pi Data Talk. So I came to the right place. So a single stock is not just a trend. Um, I'm going to have to duck out of this slide here for a second. So this is an Amazon stock. A year ago, it was worth that much money. And today, it's worth a considerable bit more. It was $1,858 a year ago, $2,409 today. It gained $550 over the year. Uh, on the 1858, that's 29%. So that's okay. It's not bad. Uh, you and I as a stockholder will never see that dividend at all. Um, Amazon keep that money took close. But um, if you look at the Amazon stock on Google, you can see that going from there to there is a difference of $550. There was a lot more money to be made than that across the year. If you bought there, for example, in March, just before Patrick's Day, and sold today, you would be a lot richer. There's just nearly $700 or more in the difference there. So trading bots and algorithms, a lot of guys want to just buy the stock and then sell it and buy it again and hold it for a while and sell it. That's called going long, where I think it's going to increase in value, so I'll buy it so I can sell it in the future. But agreeing to sell it today for a price and then being allowed to buy it for any from any point in the future where it might be worth less money. That's a short sale. So if Amazon stock was worth 1858 on the 20th of May last year, and a couple of weeks later it was only worth 1692, buying it when it was worth 1858 and selling it, so sorry, agreeing to sell it when it's 1858 and buying it to cover the sale when it's only 1692 means you're up a couple of hundred dollars there. So short sales are important. And they give you access to the absolute movement of the stock. Every movement up and down is potentially a gain to you. So when you tot up, and I didn't tot up every single movement, but I've totted up the major ones from the lows to the highs and some of the choppy bits in between, where there's like 50 up and 50 down to be made. Um, it's a lot more. Uh, if I tot up all these numbers, and I did on, on a Linux desktop, I'm on Windows now presenting this, uh, there was 3,000... $258 worth of movement in total on the stock. And if you add that on top of the 1858, it would be the same as the stock traveling in a straight line to a price of 5117. It's 275% of, of an increase there. So that would be a success for a trading bot, not 4% or 10%. Inflation might go beyond 4% or 10%. In fact, a bank would give you 4% maybe on a deposit account. Um, and they can afford to do that. So when you're looking at a stock and reading it, you really want to read every single move up and down, and you want to be able to engage on a trade up and down. You won't be able to engage on every single trade, but a lot of them. And this chart here that I showed you was the yearly chart. But what happens, I mean, within a day, for example, like you can see here today, the stock market has been all over the shop. And an unknown stock, Sabre here, up, almost 8% at one point, back down now to 5%. I think they were even up 10%. Or, no, it's only 6% here earlier. But um, that is a huge jump out of the, the bat and up and down today. So a lot of money to be made if you could have bought here, sold here, short sold to here, bought to here, short sold, etc. Um, like if you stretch out that line, there's an animal amount of money to be made. Um, so intraday trading is even more lucrative than end of day trading, uh, which is more lucrative than you know, investing money, sinking money for a few months in the stock and taking it back out. So if there's lots of money to be made on the movement during the day, how do you find the signal to tell you when to move? So, so we know what we want to look at. We know what granularity we want to look at it. We understand that there's moves both up and down that we can make money on. The question is, how the hell do we know when to make the move? And this is where some of the fails creep in. Um, where, where the people, the concept they have in their head is, is not entirely correct for what they're trying to do for the problem they're trying to solve. Because it's not just a data problem, data comes into it later. 
Um, so there is the stock. Intraday movement is the important thing. The goals of this game. Um, for every tick, for every stock, whether it's a daily tick or an hourly tick or a minute tick, you want to know the price coming into it, and the price going out of it, the open and close, and the high low. And um, as uh, Erdogan said earlier, candlestick graph is your answer to that question. You've probably seen a lot of these for stocks. Some of you probably know what they are. Some of you might have never seen them before, don't know what they are. Uh, very simply, the price at which the stock enters and exits is the open close, and the bar represents that difference. If it opened low and closed high, it's green, it's positive, it's good, or it's white in the, in the kind of traditional method. And the absolute minimum the stock went to during that time period and the absolute maximum is the high low. So the line represents the total movement. So it may have opened, at some point got a lot lower, at some point got incredibly high and closed out somewhere here. Um, the opposite, when you're losing, is uh, it opens high but it went low, closed at a lower price there. And again, the total movement high and low there. Bullish, bullish means people want to buy or go long. That's just a financial term, bull market, good long market. Bearish market, people don't want to buy. They're trying to stash their money somewhere else. They're very cautious. Uh, shorting, things like that, or short selling is a thing that happens in bear markets. So bullish, bearish, you'll hear the words thrown around. It's just investors trying to confuse you with jargon in the hope you won't understand. Um, but that candlestick graph and understanding the candlestick brings you to your most important tool to find a signal a Bollinger Band. Uh, anybody doing data has probably seen this before. Anybody who hasn't probably hasn't. Bollinger Band is a way of measuring how far a stock is deviating away from an average. Bollinger Band I've used here is a 20-day rolling average, and I'm interested in it moving two standard deviations from that. And that gives me that picture. For that stock saber, that's hugely important because you can see that stock shot outside that band entirely and skim the edge of it for a long while up here. And you'll notice that at its peak, the lower Bollinger band, the blue bit on the bottom, actually starts to turn normally on the peak. It's strange that, but that's just the way it works. Um, and the, the, the upper and lower bands begin to track up with the stock. And then the stock usually will turn and it has to regress back, which is a very important thing I'll touch on um, and move again. Bollinger bands usually inflate, and after a period of inflation, they contract quite tightly, and then inflate again, and contract, and inflate, contract, inflate, contract. Um, a slow-moving stock, if I was to reorganize this chart and look at DIA, which is the Dow Industrial Average, and um, that Bollinger band would be almost you know, flat either side of that today, very steady graph, but I, I wanted to highlight this stock here more. Um, the question is, at this point here, was the stock going to turn and go down or at this point here? And that's the signal you have to try and look for to make money out of algorithmic trading. And that is a really tricky thing to do. Um, so there are some guys here. First of all, for Bollinger Bands, I threw a link into the page if anyone hasn't done one before. They're incredibly easy to do in Python because the language is just very easy to program with. Um, if you, oh, whatever, get that out of there. If you're using Scikit, learn or you're using pandas or any of these it's very easy to do sometimes it's automatically in there but um in pandas here uh, simply using the mean and the standard deviation for a 20-day rolling window is the easiest way to get the the upper band and the lower band programmed in and um, so that link is in the slides you can see it there applied to facebook i'm allergic to because we're a really bad company but um so uh and there's a, an even better illustrated graph if, if you couldn't see the picture clearly, but there it is there with the Bollinger Band and the mean, uh, the, the rolling average for that stock and the stock in blue. So regression to the mean is how you make money in this game here. So the easiest way to do this is to think of coin tosses. So if I toss a coin, you will say it's a 50-50 chance it's going to be head or tails, which is only true in the entire infinity of the universe for all the coin tosses. Uh, the wave function for an event that has two outcomes of equal weight is 50-50. But it doesn't mean 
every t- coin toss is going to strictly obey that. I could go around the corner, and I know you won't believe me, but toss six heads in a row and then come back into the room and say to you, what do you think, heads or tails? And it is more likely to be a tail than a head. And you think that's BS, but it's not. If I exaggerate the example, if I go around the corner and toss a coin for half of the existence of the universe and toss only heads, I know that the other, every other toss in this coin for the rest of the universe's existence must be a tail to balance out the wave function or something's horrifically wrong with a normal distribution. So in the same way that this stock shot off there, it had to come back at some point because you know, I mean, it will shoot off for, 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 a, for a very good reason. Something good happened in the news. Someone might have had a breakthrough in COVID. Their stock's going through the roof. Someone might have agreed a trade deal. Uh, something else might have suddenly become cheaper. It might be a breakthrough announced somewhere else. Someone had a good quarter of profit. Those things will always drive a stock price, but only so much, and it has to regress back a little bit. Because overall, if I go on the kind of a one-year plot, things follow a more steadier curve over time. Uh, this stuff here is 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 not good, right? This is this is this is Donald Trump's bull market being tweeted to absolute pieces over Christmas. Rally, 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 rally. COVID nineteen. Oh shit, we're not actually doing anything. We're staying home from work. Massive, massive topple right down, and then this ridiculous massive surge back out of it um, with investors in, in the states going absolutely crazy as if opening back up the country was going to be like WrestleMania 10 and it was going to equal as millions of dollars all of a sudden. Um, these stocks are all US-centric. They're New York Stock Exchange. They're NASDAQ stocks. They're the only ones available in the Investopedia game. There's my, my, my game there and my trade history. Um, so they're the stocks I deal with. If you, if you look at European stocks, they're going to be much different. They're not going to have this wild bullish streak in them. But um, that's the gotcha. So... Uh, so regression to the mean is your key thing to make money. Never try and worry about the money you lost when the thing suddenly shot up. Be ready to make money when it has to drop back down, when it has to regress to the mean. Um, that's why the money I've made is not through the roof. It, I mean, if I caught every single curve along the year, I probably would have a million out of the 100,000, but it's impossible to do that. I can just catch what's coming back. Um, so that's how you would do it. You want to build a trading bot. You want to solve the problem. You'd have to get the stock. You'd have to get the candlestick graph for every minute. You would have to use something like the Bollinger Bands to plot the deviation and see when it moves out so far enough away from the mean that it's going to have a regression. You'd have to pull it back. It's not always right. Sometimes it can we'll see in a second. Um, as the previous talk alluded, fake news and Twitter has way too heavy an effect on this nowadays. Um, but one of the other goals is you can't really do it well with one stock. As you can see, I have a cluster of stocks here and they all, they all have some very interesting things you can't see at this point. I'll just I'll kind of zoom in a little bit because, yeah, there you go. Now you can see it a little better there. So when one goes down, one goes up. And sometimes many of them go up together. So uh, gold, usually when gold is doing well, it means everything else is declining. So you can see when Sabre began to drop there shortly after um, Xerox began to drop and gold was steadily starting to make the increase. And then when Xerox had a turn of fortune, gold steadied off. And you can see again, as gold was doing well, the Russell Hobbs IWM uh, index was doing bad and then it picked itself back up. And the um, S&P 500 Dow and all these guys, they didn't have much of an effect on that. It would be there. It's just not very pronounced in that line. But you can see a very slight O from that position over to there. So some stocks are perfectly inverted. Some are covariant. Some move a proportion of the other, but they all have some kind of correlation. Unfortunately, it can flip rapidly if something changes in the world. An earthquake in one place can make everyone flip one way together or another and these things are impossible to avoid so um so you got to use many stocks because the chances of them all moving completely out of kilter at one time are very slim so the goal is to trade a lot of stocks that correlate and try and find signals between them now uh, this is something i did try and do and um, you need minute by minute data and data was being scraped for weeks on end from various sources around the world while you could get it minute by minute it would be held for a few days and tried to correlate between the stocks. But at the time, Corona was breaking out into the world. 
and it was absolutely impossible to nail a signal amongst all the noise. So maybe in a few months when thing can, things calm down, it might be possible to train a learning algorithm to accurately spot when these things turn and the hinge points for each of these um, correlations. Um, but the signals can change if something changes in the world. So what we knew before Corona may not actually apply afterwards. They can change very abruptly when that oaf in the White House takes to a phone, suddenly announces something that's true or not true, or not even close to true. And um, so Trump tweets, again, I would love to actually spend some time with Irishmond and her researchers and have a look at what actually goes on on Twitter in terms of stocks. I'd say it would overlay very well onto these data sets. But uh, when Elon Musk got high on Joe Rogan's podcast, very famously, and then not so long after announced he had private uh, investors to take the company back off the stock market, he made Tesla stock move incredibly huge. And uh, and if anyone doesn't watch Tesla stock, uh, which I might go back here and have a look at, Tesla stock is the craziest stock of all. The range of motions it goes through based on the nonsense that Elon Musk tweets uh, I suppose it's not all nonsense, but yeah, in the last six months, um, some of the spikes going from like $400, $300 in the end of last year, shooting all the way up to $800, $900, dropping down back up. And a lot of this stuff wasn't just, you know, off the back of Corona. That spike there was a crazy one. I remember that day because it did a drop from over $800, you know, $140 drop just based off madness that he was tweeting at at the time. Um, and his fall from gray started on February the 19th, not March the 16th, which is down here. Um, so he, he actually moved randomly a lot more before anyone else did um, and has picked back up to somewhere around here. But uh, that, is, that is not the way any kind of market should behave. That's incredibly unhealthy if that's happening. And it's a, it's a real danger sign for the rest of the planet. All your pensions and everything are all caught up in that. So i um, him, COVID-19, investors plainly living in cuckoo land, just this bounce back that you're seeing here for all stocks. Absolutely insane that the underlying economy and manufacturing sectors, the service sectors and unemployment numbers are not even closely telling us that number. So uh, that'll bring me to a point later on. Uh, lying is a really bad thing. Um, repurchase activity. Last September, when we thought the stock market would collapse, the end of October, actually, uh, that should have happened in September. All of these companies traded all their assets, loans, bonds, any rubbish they had for cash overnight to shore up their books as they did the end of the Q3 figures. And they've actually been limping along with that for a long while. And now the Fed is starting to pull a plug in it. So um, that has masked the problem for a long while. That's incredibly hard to deal with in data because getting access to repo markets is a really difficult thing. To do is really difficult to chart the activity and it has a massive effect on the stock market. So it's a signal you're blind to that scuppers that. Um, but in amongst the attempts, the, the kind of failish attempts, which uh, they're technically a fail if you're trying to make money, but I think they're really interesting work and what these guys have been trying to do is where to look. Um, this guy's tried to predict the stock market movement. Um, his real stock market movement versus his prediction is very close. But unfortunately, uh, his prediction always lags by a day, which is really difficult. You'll never make money off that. And, and that's, you know, I suppose, in a way, that's sort of the idea. But um, even at a day behind, if for certain situations, if his predictability really is as good as he's showing here, um, that's incredible work. Probably better applied to weather, where it's all right to be a day late with that. Not for the stock market, but um, very interesting post. A lot of code up there, uh, very well explained. Worth a read if you want to have a look at that. Um, and another guy building an AI trading bot for free, more of an event-driven system. To be honest, it's done in Quantopian, but this guy is trying to show you how to do it at home and run it uh, on a cloud somewhere in Python. Um, he boasts he makes 20%, but you know anyone can say a number. But he's got the basics of spotting a signal here. Um, but I don't think there's enough correlation and enough, not looking at enough signals, it doesn't really work well on one stock. But still, it's interesting work, could probably be expanded on um, and be of real use. Uh, the data bit, which I did want to talk about, uh, is a very difficult thing to do. So in Bank of America, we did try and do this a few years ago. We had a platform called Quartz, and we stored our data 
as living objects in an object database. And the idea was you never, you didn't store prices in a table in a dead database and just have them there archived. Um, anytime you wanted to price the object, everything that hinged on it, all of the other factors, correlations, trends, whatever it was, were represented in a graph. Some of the things were pieces of data. Some of them were actual functions that were calculated on the fly. But when you asked for the price right there and then at that moment, it gave you the live price as best it could. And that is incredibly difficult. And it's not a great system real time. It requires a lot of CPU power to make it work well real time. It's a very expensive system to run as anyone who would work with me or has worked with me before would know. But it's the closest thing I've ever seen to being able to model the problem properly. And uh, maybe in the future when CPU power goes up, it will become a better thing. But um, it's a very, very difficult, can't go into it because it's proprietary, but um, using graphs with living functions on them and other pieces of data and connecting them into all kinds of systems all over the world to actually get an accurate price in the stock is just not feasible for the, the average Joe. Um, which brings me to the last bit. If you're ever going to get involved in this, do the fake one first. Don't put your money on the line. Don't buy into crypto. Do not buy into crypto. Do not believe crypto. Crypto is a cult. Please do not fall into that. Um, they are your enemies out there, crypto cults. Uh, they sing about the money being up. They never sing about it when it goes down. Investment firms are up against you. They have huge leverage. An investment firm can waltz into the market tomorrow and buy the crap out of a certain stock and just completely bully the price one way or another. They're not supposed to, but they can. And it's difficult to catch them when they do that. Social media, like I said, one of the most impossible things to plot a signal from has a massive effect on everything in the world. Uh, it may not matter to you now, but anyone who's close to retirement, Corona, for example, and the misinformation that's stopping it from being fought properly, and the real information which is getting buried, and the effect it's had in the stock market, that is really going to tarnish people's uh, investment. Anyone retiring in the next three to five years, like, it's going to be very difficult. They're going to have lost a lot. Um, accounting ninjas, people who cook the books and keep companies looking good. Anyone who's seen the big short, the ratings agencies openly uh, took bribes, basically, um, to keep the ratings of the mortgage-backed securities as appearing as high, even though they weren't. And there was a huge chapter in that in that movie in the book and who uh, you'd seen in the movie. So um, if the people rating the value of these things don't want to rate them any worse than, than they would like, you've got no hope against that. And who's got your back? No one's got your back in these situations. I would like to say that in all of the work I've done, Blockchain, I actually did find a use case for blockchain and it's not storing uh, bitcoins which are of absolutely no value because you can't eat them and I can't bring them to a supermarket here and buy food or flour to make bread. So they're utterly useless to me and, and anyone else really. But um, the blockchain database, which records transactions in a way that once it's agreed, it can't be tampered with, is probably the most vital tool to bringing order to the stock market. If labor, materials, time, energy, and effort were recorded and logged and ledgered in the blockchain, it would be impossible to argue against them. It would be very possible to make accurate predictions about stocks and prices. You wouldn't have a market that's hell-bent on growing. It wouldn't be able to grow so quick. You'd have a flat economy where things are managed as in there's always enough supply to meet the demand, which is actually the goal of any stock market in ancient China and India and Greece. This is how it was done. Um, so that is a huge use case for blockchain. I really hope blockchain people actually uh, bring that to the fore. The last thing I'll say is, uh, I said the blockchain bit, uh, the Greek philosophy stated that life is a struggle and a toil, but when you accept it, it's actually great fun. Mm -hmm. And the American philosophy deludes people into believing there's a better state for everyone and that every person is entitled and has a right to reach that state. And it is basically the Greek nightmare. And... If anyone did wonder where Corona or COVID came from, it was warned about for years by the WHO that having children work in cobalt mines to mine the materials for your batteries and having basically slave labor, people working for the minimum, minimum wage in a factory all day, traveling home in huge numbers and crammed public transport, living in poverty, living in, on top of each other, three and four families in the house. Flu always lives in those areas it always stays alive your immune system is weak and not really up to getting rid of it and it lives from person to person and in those impoverished conditions and it's been warned for years that 
places like China, parts of Africa, parts of India, parts of South America, just where it's not well economically developed, is highly likely to have an outbreak like this at some point. And it's very coincidental to me that when the stock market reaches its highest high, that this thing comes out when the, when the world economy is running to the bone uh, overly hot for, for so long. So I think we should all look at how many phones we've bought in the last few years and how many we really needed to buy and ask ourselves the question, was it worth it? And on that horrible note, making you all feel shame, I'm going to leave it right there. It's stinky out of it. <laughs> and hand it back for questions if anyone would like to ask a question to me. But I don't think anyone will. Well, thank oh, no, I've got loads for you. Mm -hmm. Oh no. <laughs> oh dear. I just get question juice here. No, that'll help. There is one in the Q&A as well. There is okay. not Python related. So if yep. you don't want to, if you don't want to reply. Uh, so no George, Georgios is asking, um, which broker do you use? Ah, so on Investopedia, I'm doing I, I execute the trades investopedia is not real it's a game it's 15 minutes behind bloomberg which means it's live with yahoo or google or any of these things and it's the easiest way to go learn about it you won't be imposed with any limits you can spend your money what way you want certain margin rules don't apply if i did use a broker um <laughs> I don't know which one I'd use. I'd look for the app with the cheapest fees, obviously, and the one that allows me to trade the most. But, like, it's one thing doing it when it's your money. And it's one thing doing it when it's fake money. When it's your money, just, like, what I showed you there with those stocks took years of me working in the bank. I just took a crack at it at the end. That's the end result of reading lots about how things correlate. And, like, I'll be honest with you, spending hours in the morning on market watch news, it's like serious study. It, it's like a continual PhD. Not that it's impossible. I'm not saying anything big about me, but it's just really nerdy, detailed read of it. And if you don't have that uh, passion for it, just be careful because you could sink a lot of money down and lose. Like, you can't get it back once you've lost it. I could restart that game again if it went really bad. But, and you know, in previous years when I did learn and started out four or five years ago, I did delete games. I didn't do well in them. Like I got creamed in a couple of months. So please don't do that with your own money unless you're very, very sure. Because they're all crooks, all of them. I can tell you. Good stuff. I think actually, just for the sake of safety, I should point out that you're expressing your own personal preference. Okay, <laughs> that we can't. Yeah. We, oh, yeah. we're, we, we don't, we're not a. Uh, they're not uh, necessarily endorsed by anybody else. That no, just... I'm not endorsed by anyone else. But, but what I would say is remember that um, like a good example of a forward is imagine uh, the Chicago Bulls are playing a game of basketball and they're 10 points up at halftime. And I have a ticket that says they're going to win. At halftime, that looks like a really good bet. And if there was 20 bucks to be made on that bet, I could say, here, do you want to buy this ticket for 10 off me? And you can win the other 10 at the end of this game. Now, the game hasn't finished yet. And I'm at half time giving you the option to go on and win it. I'm trying to get out with some money in my pocket. But if it goes incredibly wrong, you know, you're, you're taking the loss on that. So, and, and, and also, if, if it's a thing that the, the game score is moving up and down and up and down and it has moved up and down, if it's been tit for tat, I may have the feeling that Chicago Bulls are going to go on and win and you may think that the Lakers are going to go on and win. And we have two completely opposing views while we're looking at the same data. It's called split screen syndrome. Um, it happens if, if the Nazis looked at a war movie and the Allies looked at a war movie, both of them see completely different things, but it's the same movie. When Donald Trump says something on TV, his supporters would say, thank God he's there, he's saving us all, he's back. Other people would say, oh my God, we're, you know, coronavirus is what it is, but some people see 5G and some people see social distancing as a good thing. So what I say in the stock market is, like they're not obviously crooks because uh, they haven't been proven in, in court to be crooks, but they may have a, they may be betting heavily against something or they may be trying to sell something to you and tell you a particular story. But like you know, be very careful what you're betting against out there. Just that that's what I mean by that. It is a hugely, hugely, hugely gray area, and it's money. <laughs> it's not Lego or a, you know or badges that you're trading with. It's real cash. Could be your future. I know people who've lost everything on, on crypto and you know that was their 
that was her nest egg. And nothing I could do to convince him of that. Good stuff. Um, just uh, sort of, uh, uh, let's say, I just sort of, uh, you're in a great position to answer some really interesting questions. More so, more general topics rather than, uh, first off, actually, it's about if uh, somebody was interested in getting into finance using Python, like quantitative finance right now, what sort of future do you have, think they would have? Let's say it's a first year student in a college and they're that's what they want to do in life. Maybe it's a big brother or a big sister told them to do quantitative finance and learn Python. Do you think the world is going to be different now? Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, like, like, like that entire uh, stretch there about honesty and then crypto and all of that stuff um, and blockchain, and all of that stuff. Python, like it is, it has been for years. It's one of the, if there's any tutorial out there, Python's probably the easiest one to learn. To get it down and running on your laptop, it's easy. To get it out on the cloud and running, it's very easy. Um, it's always been an easy language to spool up and get running. There's a lot of companies are fond of that now. Like Revolut, for example, have a lot of Python on the back end of their, their, their digital payments platform, which is another big, massive future for everyone. But, um, but a lot of the ideas are easy to implement in Python because you're thinking more about the idea than you're worrying about the management of the code. I've often found in Java, you, you get bogged into trying to straighten Java out first before you get the problem done. And for that reason, a lot of people go, they're, they're more worried about the, the carpentry and the joining on the corner than what's at the end when the house is built. So um, Python is a huge advantage for that. But the second thing is there's a lot of articles out there with a lot of examples on finance on Python. There's a lot of interesting things that aren't finance related, but actually are very similar concepts to finance going on in, in the machine learning circles in a lot of the Python talks. So, I mean, if you're young and you have any interest in this stuff, if you are excited by gambling or betting or the stock market and you're into Python, uh, just reach out to the community and get connected to people. But bet, betting companies, gambling companies, online gambling companies, banks, investment firms, hedge funds, any of those guys um, would be interested in you in another few years. But a lot of the smaller firms that are starting up digital banking, global payments, the revolutes and the stripes of the world, they're, they're going to be interested in people of skills in that too. And at some point, they're going to want to move into banking because when you're holding on to money in the middle, there's a possibility for you to make uh, a few pounds on that. And anyone who's uh, got ahead for that, if you have a few more years experience and you know anything about risk management or anything in, in banking terms, business-wise, uh, central banking type stuff, You'll, you'll be in demand pretty soon for that. Great stuff. Just a sort of second question. Um, uh, following on from like uh, giving advice to a career young professional, let's say you had to give them a quick shopping list. Like they still want to do finance, let's say, but like you give them a quick shopping list of things to have in their CV, things to be able to talk about eloquently in an interview. Uh, Python related, like for example, pandas, numpy, that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Panda is the most applicable one to anywhere in a bank. Uh, to the ability to be able to pick up any piece of tabular data and slice and slap it around, and pandas is hugely, a uh, hugely common thing. It's one of the most used things you'll do. Um, you can probably do some of it in Excel, but if you if you want it to run automatically, you're going to want to do it in something like Python and Pandas. After that, Monte Carlo stuff, very useful. If you go into Quantopian platform, there's a great amount of Python resources there. It is on their own API, but it will teach you the concepts. But um, any any kind of forecasting simulation that doesn't rely so heavily on data because it's not kind of closed form solution stuff you're trying to make predictions to fill in the gaps that's something worth getting into um, part of it is a little bit rock, rocket science but it's okay and then on the data front just any like doesn't have to be finance gathering weather data i mean the, the social media talk before was brilliant that's a prime example of going out there like that that would be under geopolitical risk or social risk which you know is a thing that affects stock markets but being able to garnish large amounts of data, work with APIs, crunch it down, present it, 
Um, just remember what it is at the end you're trying to present, that kind of stuff. That kind of uh, hobbyist interest in that curiosity about the world, that talks volumes more than anything in an interview. If it was even only about the history of Formula One races and whatever metric stuff that you wanted to do, it could easily be applied to anything else. Anyone that shows that kind of initiative, take the hand off them and all to get them in the door. Um, you know, it's the hobbies are where the, the main skills are at. It's not just regurgitating years of experience and I did this and that in this project. It's having something that you're passionate about and enjoying. That's what will get you through an interview. Good stuff. Yeah, no, I'm just very conscious of, uh, we're talking about an economic crisis in Ireland and we're just sort of thinking back to where we were 10 years ago uh, when the last economic crisis and how people sort of adapted just by, uh, you know, pivoting towards technology in their careers and stuff like that, you know, so that that's sort of where it came from. People sort of like who might have different careers over the next few years. Or, or, or also people who are very young in their careers, let's say 20 year olds and, you know, they're learning Python in college for the first time and all that. That's where that was came, coming from. I'll just see if we have any more questions there. No, okay. I, I'm, I'm done, I think. I actually have a question for you. Uh, so you were talking, you were talking about, oh, first of all, amazing talk it was was really 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 cool i had i have, have had a look uh, at uh, that medium post the one that you're saying that the guy said that talks about the 20 percent and you can say anything it was like mm, this seems really interesting and i was curious actually about studying studying doing that tutorial to see what was going to come out of it but um you're mentioning before um platforms such as revolut and um and you're talking about how crypto um, isn't real money because you can't go and buy bread with it. Um, Coinbase launched not that long ago a credit card. So it's a Visa credit card that you can put your, your crypto in and you can use that outside. And I put money on crypto as well. It just kill me now. Uh, but I have a few points. Don't do it. You do it. <laughs> I do. Um, I have very little Bitcoins, but I like the way Ethereum behaves. I like their technology and I like what they're doing apart from crypto. But anyway, um, yeah, so there is a way of bringing that money into the corner shop and buying bread with it. There what? is, right? But, so, so the, 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 but what's going to get you? Is, so so here's, here's what I don't like about it. It's just my opinion. Um, it moves wildly in a way that doesn't correlate to anything. So it's always a sensational thing, crypto. Like you can drop $8,000 overnight and then regain six again the next day. That to a bank is a huge warning sign that there's something crooked going on. It's, it's flat out over like, go back 60, 70 years into the books of any big bank. Any of them, JP Morgan, Sachs, any of them, they'll all tell you the same thing. That's when there's a warning sign on there. Goldman Sachs will broker Bitcoins for you. They'll charge you a fee. They're not holding them themselves. They have no interest in buying or selling into that. But they'll help you do it. They'll provide a service to you because they're serviceable people. And they're very, they're very smart people in Goldman Sachs. Um, so they'll do that. But ultimately, if you pull the plug on the server, it's the thing is worth nothing like that. It's dead. But the gold is always there and the gold is usable in science. Now, I don't agree with the arguments Peter Schiff and crypto have, and I have on Twitter, if you find me on there, I've had to pull Peter Schiff out of arguments, just tell him to go to bed and turn off his phone because he's had nothing. But um, they clash head to head over everything. But like a bank wouldn't, even Brian Moynihan, our CEO, has said, you know, it's not something we'd be interested in crypto because it doesn't move in any way that you can safely really bank on. It can go too far too fast. And, and it's not that any bank lacks the technical expertise to do it. It's just there is no model to safely navigate through it. And if I threw all, if I suddenly said to you tomorrow, well, you don't have any money in your bank account because guess what? Crypto went crazy last night. But then in a month's time after you've gone hungry and you had no money, we go, hey, dude, we've got good news for you. We got all your money back and a little bit more because crypto went good again. No one can live like that. So we can't, you have to have a steady flow of cash to do the thing. You can't do it with that. So I'm baffled still as to who's chucking big money into it, but 
Um, the other thing is it's not possible to tell who's buying and selling on either side. Like, it is a great way to launder money, and we all know that. And if it's a great way to launder it, there's no point in a couple of Bitcoin guys saying, well, no one launders on it. That's just not true. People launder money in banks, even though the banks are set up to catch them from doing it, but they still get away with it. And in small amounts, it still happens. They get caught, they go to jail. You know, eventually a bank will catch someone laundering money, but sometimes it can take a few months or a year to catch them out, no matter how vigilant you are, because people always find a way. There's a lot of machine learning on that topic, which is really good. But in the crypto market, People can launder like crazy. No one will stop them. No one will investigate them. No one regulates them. They're under nothing at all. It's quite they new. all equip back. Yeah. It's quite new as quite. well. So it's, yeah. Okay. Well, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. There's another question there. Um, I'll let you take it there, Lies. Okay. Uh, so it's a question from Navan Kurverma. So uh, she's asking you, so can you suggest about how much visualizations are important in finance and what a specific Python, library are, Python libraries are being used other than normal ones, Matplotch, Bokeh, Plotly? Uh, the notebooks for me are one of the greatest visual tools uh, on the go in Python. They're, um, I'll give you an example. If you do a massive amount of big data number crunching and you aggregate your answer up, stuff it into a notebook, um, just rerun the notebook off that, and you're able to present all the important visuals and metrics and that, it's a living piece of documentation. Um, and it depends on the actual thing you're trying to show. I mean, if it's a, it's a simple pie chart of you know, where your, your market base is, or if it's a graph showing a spike or a drop or a predicted thing, it, depending on what you want to do, um, it doesn't really matter. In our place, we're limited in the number of libraries we can bring in. We, we have a, a PIP repository and a Conda repository that it takes a while to vet you know, public libraries and get them in. We have to make sure they're secure. So Matplot is one I use a lot of uh, in a Jupyter notebook. But the, broad, the, the bigger question, I think, is are visuals important? Absolutely. If the data science is important to find out what the truth is, the final bit of presentation, absolutely critical because you are more than likely going to present important detail to someone who, has, who will not look at it. Like you, you can't expect a senior trading manager to look at an Excel table with 100,000 rows in it and decipher from that in five minutes what he's supposed to do for the rest of the day. You bring it in in, in graph form with the problem perfectly highlighted, color coded not being rude, like, you know, like Fisher Price <laughs> that a child could understand. But that, that's what you want because in a split second, he will understand it and he'll make a decision and he'll want the next graph up and that speeds up the whole day. So the ability to present and to sift through the numbers and get the important stuff out and be accurate, hugely, not, in, not just in banks, anywhere in the world, it's a skill that's been lacking for a long while. And even some of the, some of the data presentations you do see, you can see in the presentation someone's already gone off track down a bit of a rabbit hole and they throw a big thing up on the screen and it's hard to see what's actually going on in it. So um, that's a good skill to practice, staying on track. But yeah, graphics important. Cool. Then uh, we have another question uh, from Jason. So um, uh, aside from financial gain with Bitcoin, how do you see Python can be used with distributed ledger, which means proof of work, as you mentioned? Oh, yeah. Now that that's... I, that's the uh, huge important use case for that. Um, I don't, for the ledger work, banks may want to ledger everything, definitely, because it can't be tampered with. At some point, they want to extract it and have it in a, in a straight up uh, relational database just to be able to aggregate and do work with, or maybe some big data thing, but you have to be able to do those functions, means, deviations, groups, all that kind of stuff. So I know that blockchain isn't strictly suited to that off the bat, and there is some work around that to make it a little easier. But but movements of like movements of commodities, um, for futures contracts, moving oil around, it's a big thing you have to do and double check it's in one place and then in the other. Uh, movement of corns or grains or cereals or fruit, orange juice, milk, whatever it is, dairy, you name it, anything we move around the world, timber that we want to sell, blockchain ledgering for logistics is like massively important for that. 
And I, I do see there's easy bindings for Python to work with that. Um, I think what companies need to know is how is it easy and effective to set up a blockchain store of their own just to, to leisure their work and then how it's easy to make it open where it needs to be open for other people to be able to leverage what's going on in there. But um, I mean, if enough of the important movement of goods in the world and, and people and effort was properly ledgered and blockchain, then you could do a decent enough pull between them. Like I said, in the trading problem, you would not be relying on gut feeling and instinct and people reacting to things on Twitter to drive the stock market. It would be there in black and white, observable by everyone, agreeable by everyone. There would be no argument about the price. Arbitrage would be much less than it is today. So I think anybody who has a skill with blockchain can get it running quickly and is good with Python and can and it can explain and apply good use cases for blockchain on an interview. I mean, that, or even at a presentation at some conference where someone might see it, that's gold going forward. Just being able to use the tool properly. You know yourself when a tool comes out, it'll do everything. It'll cure Corona. It'll bring us to Mars. It'll do all these things. It won't. It'll only do the job it's supposed to do. It's just a type of hammer. But being able to explain why it's a good hammer and where exactly to hammer it, blockchain might be missing that a little bit at the moment. And if anyone is any good at that, fair play to you. Cool. Well, thank you. I think that's the end of our questions. Brilliant. Go back to playing Star Trek. <laughs> I'll just uh, finish off with one little comment. It's not really a question. It's just to sort of accompany your answer. People who are new to Python, and they may be able to sort of check out a couple of the things you mentioned, like Jupyter Notebooks uh, and some of those visualization libraries and things like NumPy and Pandas. Now, I'm giving it a plug here. There's a thing called notebooks.azure.com that you can set it up and just sort of get practicing with them. You know, this is really aimed at beginners, if you get me notebooks.azure.com and um, that's all so it, it's not I don't think it's the most recent version of Python I think there's some limitations but really this is sort of aimed towards people who are getting started if you get me definitely yeah definitely especially for a power data talk if we're all about data get the notebooks stuff your data in do cool things with them share them with each other Put yeah there. totally good call Kevin yeah just to get started is the hard thing actually Finding out how to start and easy ways to get started. Okay, I think I'll, I'll hand over to Laise to bid us all farewell. Thanks, Laise. Thanks, Niall. I'll, leave you, I'll sign off here. Well, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Arjuman, uh, for the great talk on Twitter. Thank you, Niall. Um, well, and thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you to all the attendees. Thank you. Uh, for being part of this. Thank you for sticking with us. Uh, thank you for everyone that was watching us live on Twitch as well and YouTube. And we are back here next Monday. Uh, thank you very much and well, enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye bye. <laughs>